Go ahead. Hey, good morning. This is Judge Stanley. And um, as we discussed at the pre hearing conference, I'm going to say that every time I speak so that our stenographer can catch every word, I'd ask you to identify yourselves before you speak to. Um, welcome to the Office of Tax Appeals. Today's oral hearing for the appeal of C by Carino will be held electronically and is already being live streamed. Um, the transcript that will be made is part of the public record and will be posted on the Office of Tax Appeals website. Our stenographer, Ms. Alonzo, is reporting this, this hearing word for word. To ensure we have an accurate record, we ask that everyone speak one at a time. Don't speak over each other. Speak clearly and loudly. And when needed, Ms. Alonzo can stop the hearing and, um, and uh, ask for clarification. After the hearing, she's going to produce the official hearing transcript. Um, and we are, we are conducting today's hearing electronically with the agreement of the parties. As we discussed at the pre-hearing conference, um, please also um, mute your microphone if you are not speaking to avoid feedback um, and background noise. If any participant has technical errors or disconnects, we'll take a brief recess and get them reconnected. Um, instructions are included in your um, meeting invitation, uh, so you can refer to that if you have any issues. Um, okay, we are, looks like we're ready to go ahead and go on the record and get the hearing started. Um, Ms. Alonzo, are you ready? Okay, Ms. Alonzo gave me a thumbs up. Okay, we're on the record in the appeal of C. by Carina. It's tax, Office of Tax Appeals case number 2107-8257. The date is March 22nd, 2022, and it is 9.30 a.m. Um, <laughs> um, I have a panel of judges today. I'm Judge Teresa Stanley. I have Judge Andrew Kui and Judge Suzanne Brown. Um, I will be conducting the hearing, but all three of the panel members will equally deliberate and decide the appeal. Um, I'm going to ask the parties to identify themselves on the record. Um, and I'll start with appellants. Okay, I'm Karina Lee. And Justin Lee. Okay, and can I ask, this is Judge Stanley again, um, can I ask the uh, CDTFA to identify their uh, participants? I'm Amanda Jacobs, Tax Counsel with the CDTFA. Scott Claremont with the CDTFA. And Jason Parker, Chief of Headquarters Operations Bureau with CDTFA. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, just another housekeeping matter um, for the appellant's benefit and for the benefit of uh, observers of this hearing. The Office of Tax Appeals is independent of the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration that I refer to as CDTFA um, and any other tax agency. Um, we are not a court, but we are an independent hearing uh, appeals agency um, staffed by our own tax experts. The, because we're separate, um, the only evidence that we have in our file and our record is what the parties have presented to us in this appeal. We don't have anything that's gone on before with your interactions between each other. So just that's something that you should know. Um, we have three issues today. Um, ha whether Number one, whether appellant has shown that an adjustment to the measure of unreported taxable sales is warranted. More specifically, appellant claims that it did not collect sales tax and that respondent's position does not reflect the spirit of the law. Um, number two, is whether appellant established that the deduction for tax paid purchases resold should be increased. Um, and number three is number three is actually more of a 
concession than an issue. Um, we determined at the um, pre-hearing conference that appellant does not dispute the measure or calculation of the unreported taxable sales. Um, <clears throat> Mrs. Lee, are you, are you going to be the representative for the two of you or Mr. Lee? Mr. Lee. Okay, Mr. Lee, does that, um, do you agree that those are the issues today? Yes. Okay, and Ms. Jacobs? Yes. Okay, um, let's move on to exhibits. Um, I don't have any exhibits from appellant um, and respondents exhibits A through E will be um, entered into the record, admitted into the record uh, without objection. We did discuss these at the pre-hearing conference and there were no objections. So um, we're not going to have any opening statements since the um, appellant, appellant's representatives are the principals of the company. So what I would like to do is um, swear in both Mr. and Mrs. Lee at this time because I understand that Mr. Lee is going to be the primary witness, but Ms. Mrs. Lee may want to interject or supplement his testimony. So I'll just make sure that um, we do have everything on the record. Do you have a question, have a Mr. Question. Lee? Yeah, sorry. You, we did we did submit some exhibits. We just we um, submitted some um, the information online that was part of like sort of our case that we want to um, present. Did you guys not get the the email? We emailed that over. I think um, maybe five exhibits that we sent through. When did you email them? Before before the due date, before the seventeenth, I believe oh, we did 16th. the sixth, fifteenth, or the sixteenth. Um, okay, and do I you spoke, know what email address you used? Um, no, but I confirmed it with um, Desiree from the CDTFA. Is that what she is? The that? OTA. Oh, OTA, sorry, the OTA. And she actually had, had, we wanted to make sure that we were sending it to the right place, so she sent it to us right before. It's not, it's, it's not like completely detrimental in my, you know, in my, um, the story that I'm going to tell you, it kind of explains. It's basically us take, grabbing screenshots Online. Okay, wait, okay, wait. Yeah. I, I don't I don't want you to start presenting. Um, okay. I think it might be helpful to take a quick break and uh, see if we can see if we can um, find the email. Okay. Because we do know who Desiree is, so we can contact yeah. her. So let me, um, let me Karina go will ahead. look right now. On her phone, She'll, Karina will quickly look right now to see what um, email address it was sent to. We can find that for you right now. Hold on. Um, Is it that it? Oh, that's from Desiree. Yeah, one second, one second. Well, if Desiree responded, um, let, let's go off the record, Lynn. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take a five minute recess so that we can contact Desiree and see if she knows where it is. I don't want you okay. to be at a disadvantage. Yeah. Okay. So. Here, we found it. So it was sent um, on Wednesday, the 16th at 10:41 p.m. Um, uh, the Title Dropbox C by Karina Exhibit One through Five. Um, was that simplify your list? I don't know. Although we find, oh, oh, this is what. Sorry, this is what um, um, she had said to us. Uh, oh no, this is what we. Why does that say that there? Um, it's okay, Mr. Mr. Lee. Um, we can just yeah. go straight to her and get this straightened out. So, okay. um, okay. I please don't leave. Um, but you can mute your microphones because um, the yeah. the live streaming is still continuing. So okay. if sure. you want to yeah. stay on or off video, we'll go off video. But we'll be right we'll be right back. Hopefully, very quickly.
Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you. This is Judge Stanley speaking. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, did you say that you had received the email? This is Amanda Jacobs speaking. Yes, we did receive two emails from um, OTA, one with the zip file and one with the individual files. Okay. Um, and do you want a few minutes to take a look at those? Yes, please. We can, um, you know, we'd happy to, be happy to come back at 10 or 10, 15. Yeah, this is Scott Carmen. I don't think it'll take more than 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, then let's recess until 10. Um, again, please don't leave the meeting room um, and we'll hopefully come back and just go smoothly through the rest of this. Okay. See you at 10. May we ask and may we ask until um, 10 05 that it's it's like eight minutes till 10 now. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I'll try that again. This is Judge Stanley. We're reconvening the meeting and um, our stenographer has asked Mr. and Mrs. Lee to be careful not to speak over one another or speak at the same time so that she can doesn't have to space out her words um, for one sentence. Um, we are we are going to go back on the record now. And um, we wanted to confirm that everyone now has the exhibits and has had, a, had an opportunity to um, review them. Um, we did follow up at uh, the Office of Tax Appeals and it looks like um, the email you're referring to, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, was um, an email that was sent to request um, the email address to send it to. And so um, it looks like you didn't follow up and send it to the evidence box instead of to Desiree. So, but that's all cleared up now. We all have the exhibits. And um, so we'll go back to that part where we were talking about exhibits. And um, I will, will mark, we'll mark the appellant's exhibits um, one to five. And Ms. Jacobs, do you have any objections to those exhibits? Amanda Jacobs, we do not. Okay, great. Then we are back to the part where you can, um, we're going to have the appellant's presentation and you can um, feel free to refer to the exhibits because we all have them now. We're admitting exhibits one through five into evidence. Um, so Mr. and Mrs. Lee, can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, just for the public's benefit, I'm, I'm indicating, I, I note that I'm only swearing in the appellant's witnesses. Um, that's because you, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, will be testifying to actual facts. When it comes to the CDTFA's presentation, I will not be swearing them in because they are only arguing and applying the evidence to the law. They won't be making any factual statements that are not in our record. So um, when you are ready to proceed, Mr. Lee, um, you, can, you can do so. Okay, um, uh, please forgive me, I'm gonna read it because I have my notes here. It's gonna be about eight minutes and I'm just gonna sort of go through the story of everything and um, any questions, you know, just let me know. So uh, this whole case is about a registration that anybody can get. You do not need credentials, you just need to register and get what is called a registered dispensing optician's registration. We do not think that this has ever happened before as there are no case studies on this that we could find anywhere. As a result of the stress and the confusion of this audit, Karina ended up closing her business C by Karina. Karina is a woman owned business. Her store was her everything for over 25 years, working six days a week, dedicated to her business and sacrificing time with her family. As I go through the facts of this audit, you will see that no money was exchanged. 
And all of this is due to a registration that is $150 to get that anyone can get. You do not have to have any specific credentials to get it. To us, this does not represent the spirit of what the registration is actually there for. I believe this registration is so non-professional people who decide they want to sell prescription eyewear and are not qualified, cannot and should not do so. But it should not be reserved for well-known, very professional, well-established brick and mortar stores such as C by Karina. As I go through the timeline, hopefully you will see the situation as a flaw in the system and understand our passion and understand why we think it's so important for you to hear Karina's side of the story. The CDTFA came to C by Karina months before the audit took place to check if C by Karina had all the licenses required for her business, business license and all the other things that you need, um, et cetera. At that time, the person who came to check on her store never said that Karina was missing anything. They just came and went and gave her the impression that everything was fine. A few months later is when the CDTFA sent her the letter stating she was going to be audited. At no time was Karina worried about this audit as she had always been on time and above board on everything, from her taxes to keeping organized books, et cetera. So much so that Karina let the CDTFA spend hours and weeks on her computer in her store looking through her financials during business hours. But the whole time, Karina just wanted to be compliant and help the CDTFA with the audit and let them see that everything was up to par. In Karina's 25 years of business, she was never late on taxes and always paid everything on time. That is the frustrating part about this. Karina is being penalized for not charging her clients sales tax on prescription lenses and frames when she already prepays the sales tax when she purchases the frames and lenses from her wholesalers. Let me repeat that. Karina is being penalized for not charging her clients sales tax on prescription lenses and frames when she already prepays sales tax <clears throat> when she purchases the frames and lenses from her wholesalers. And if you know the law stated on the IRS website and the Board of Optometry website, et cetera, you are never allowed to charge sales tax to patients for prescription lenses or frames, as it is considered to be a medical device and is exempt from the patient paying sales tax. The system is flawed. Karina was so confused when she found out about this registration that she nor none of her colleagues had heard of. She knew that it had, she had to research it further. How could she have not known about this? So Karina decided to call the California Board of Optometry. She got a representative on the phone to ask, how is this possible? And this was their response. Karina's question was, how is one supposed to know or get the information that this registration is required when somebody goes to optician school? Do they provide you with a checklist of some sort? The representative's answer was, all the information is available online at the California Board of Optometry's website. Karina asked, well, what happens if you studied to be an optician 27 years ago and there was no internet at that time so thus unable to check online. Slightly thrown off, the representative responded saying, well, the information is available at the public library. And Karina was a little perplexed by this and said, where? And they replied, the California codes book. So Karina replied, so we're supposed to go look in a book, find a code, we don't know what we're looking for, then look up for a registration that we don't know that we're supposed to have. And so you see how Karina was very confused by this. The information is not readily available and very difficult to find that you need this registration to sell prescription eyewear. We strongly believe that the punishment is not in line with the circumstances. 
For the CDTFA to ask Karina to pay the amount back, the CDTFA was never collected from her patients nor exchanged in the first place is quite frankly a little bit over the top. It's 100% understandable if money was collected, but it wasn't. And the fact that it's common knowledge that you cannot charge tax on prescription frames and lenses. In closing, this was an honest mistake and this punishment is not fair. Why not have her pay the fee of $150 for the missing registration? This specific part of the system is flawed and having this registration or not having this registration does not represent the spirit of the law. I would also like to point out, as mentioned in the beginning, Karina had to close her doors to her business of over 20 years. And as a result of the stress of this audit and the confusion of it, we really felt it was important for her to tell her story and not leave her legacy on this down note, that she may, she may have done something wrong intentionally. We are aware and understand the sales tax and use law section 6829 as a corporate officer, Karina is not liable. And as specifically noted in section D, quote, for the purpose of this section, willfully fails to pay or cause to be paid, means that the failure was the result of intentional, conscious and voluntary course of action. As you can see, this has all been a misunderstanding. And I thank you all very much for your time and listening to my wife's story. And I just wanted to go through just a quick recap of everything that I just said and some bullet points. Registration, very hard to find, uh, you know, when Karina was, um, went to school. There's no internet in 1995, 27 years ago. Information was not readily available. She spoke to the California Board of Optometry and 27 years ago, they said that the information was available at the California Public Library only method of getting the information regarding the registration. Karina prepaid this tax on all her frames and lenses to the wholesalers. And it is not legal to charge patients sales tax on prescription lenses and frames. The Board of Optometry is to blame for this mistake and there's definitely a flaw in the system. Thank you so much. This is Judge Stanley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, Ms. Mrs. Lee, do you have anything to add? Mrs. Lee I indicated know. she does not. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, Ms. Jacobs, do you have any questions for the witness? This is Amanda Jacobs. No, no questions. This is Judge Stanley. Judge Kui, do you have questions for the witness? Hi, this is Judge Kui. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so, as I'm understanding it, um, the main issue was that uh, Ms. Lee did not have a registered dispensing optician license, but I understand that she did have I, a, a... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, it's not a license. It's just a registration. It's not a license. Oh, okay. Um, registration. But I yep. understand that she was registered um, as it an optician or um, either that or a spectacle lens dispenser or a contact lens dispenser. Could you clarify what her um, license was? Um, I, I'm registered with the American Board of Optometry. Uh, sorry, American Board of Opticianry. Okay, um, so is that considered a um, like a spectacle lens dispenser or a contact lens dispenser or is that something different from uh, those types of registrations? It it's different. It's different. It's not. Um, it's not with the um, board of optometry. Okay. Yeah. And just to understand, and just to understand, like about that specifically, because I know it's confusing. Trust me, we were confused about it too. Anybody can get this dispensing um, uh, optician. What is it? Registered, registered dispensing optician registration. Anybody can get it. You don't have to have any credentials to get it. You, anybody, it, it's not, there's, there's no requirements that you have to have to get it. Okay, um, so I guess the reason I was asking is because I was looking 
at the definition of a registered dispensing optician. And it says it means any of the following individuals that are registered with the board. And then one is a spectacle lens dispenser. Another is a contact lens dispenser. And then another is a registered dispensing ophthalmic business. And I, yeah. I just wasn't um, fully understanding. So you don't, you didn't fit in those definitions, either of those definitions? No, no. because I was aware that I had to, in order for um, myself to have the business and um, and be exempt from the sales tax that I had to register with um, the American Board of Optometry and because um, it didn't have anything really to do with what I was doing as an optician. Nobody ever like told me, educated me that I have to register to get all these registrations. Okay, um, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is Judge Stanley. Judge Brown, do you have any questions of the witness? Uh, I do not have any questions at this time. Thank you. This is Judge Stanley. Um, Mr. Lee, you talked about tax paid purchases where you um, where the business paid tax on um, to the wholesalers that sold the equipment to you. Um, did you ever provide any evidence of that to CDTFA? Of course, yes. yes, yes, they have everything. They 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 saw all that. They went through the books and they saw everything. That's why we're confused by this because the part of the tax that they were the CDTFA was charging back to Karina had never been exchanged, nor was it able to. It's illegal to charge patients for prescription lenses and frames. You're not, she would never. She would have gotten in trouble were she to have charged taxes on a medical device that is exempt from being charged tax. That's why it's. That's why you know our passion in this whole thing is there's a flaw in the system. It doesn't. It, it, the right hand is not talking to the left, and it's just for this piece of paper. So to charge. To, to go back and charge and understanding the CDTFA's laws and stuff, you know, in conjunction with the Board of Optometry, we understand that there's, you know, kind of like it goes into a system and it kind of spits out a number and that's what it is. But it doesn't make sense that Karina literally would have gotten in trouble if she were to have charged her patients for tax on something that's not taxable. But yet, She's being penalized to pay the tax that would have been illegal for her to, to, to pay, and she prepaid the tax on the frames and lenses prior to this. So that's where it, it's just like it's, it's, a, it's like a, a gray, weird area in the middle that doesn't make sense. This is Judge Stanley. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, I, I'm sure that CDTFA can address that um, further in their presentation, and I don't have any other questions. So, uh, Ms. Jacobs, you can proceed when you're ready. Amanda Jacobs. This is Judge Stanley. Ms. Jacobs, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. All right. This is Judge Stanley. Ms. Jacobs, now we can hear a word every now and then, but there's something wrong with your audio. Can you hear me now? Yes? Okay. I apologize, my presentation is lost. Um, if you can just give me a moment, I will find it and come back on.
This is Judge Stanley. Ms. Jacobs, do you want a five minute recess? That would be great. Thank you. I'm sorry for dragging this on. That's okay. Let's let's go ahead and give you a five minute recess. We'll see you around 1030. Thank you. Okay, this is Judge Stanley again. We're reconvening the appeal of C by Karina and we'll go back on the record now. And Ms. Jacobs, you can proceed if you're ready this time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, this is Amanda Jacobs. Appellant operated a store in Beverly Hills, California, selling prescription ophthalmic materials, including eyeglasses, frames, and lenses, and other non-prescription frames and lenses. Appellant held a seller's permit with the CDTFA since February 15, 2011, but was not registered with any state agency to be engaged in the business of dispensing prescription ophthalmic materials until after the period at issue when Ms. Lay became a registered spectacle lens dispenser on March 19, 2018, and appellant became a registered dispensing optician with the California State Board of Optometry, or SBO, on June 1, 2018. For the period of July 1, 2014 through December 31, 2017, the department determined that while appellant paid tax on the retail sale of non-prescription frames and lenses, Appellant failed to pay tax on its sales of prescription ophthalmic materials. Accordingly, staff determined a measure of disallowed claimed non-taxable sales of $687,238. Appellant's failure to pay tax was based on its mistaken belief that it was a registered dispensing optician and therefore the consumer of prescription ophthalmic materials. As such, appellant paid tax reimbursement when purchasing some of the materials and the department also determined that appellant was entitled to tax paid purchases re a tax paid purchases resold deduction of $120,766. The issues in this appeal are whether appellant is entitled to one adjustments to disallowed claimed non-taxable sales and two further adjustments to allowed credits for tax erroneously paid on property purchased for resale. Regarding the first issue no adjustment is warranted to the measure of disallowed claimed non-taxable sales or audit items one and two. As you know, California imposes sales tax on a retailer's retail sales of tangible personal property or TPP in this state unless the sale is specifically exempt or excluded from taxation by, ta by statute, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6051. All of a retailer's gross receipts are presumed to be taxable unless the retailer can prove otherwise, section 6091. We first note that the Business and Professions Code, or BPC sections, related to registered dispensing opticians have been amended since the liability period, most recently in 2021 by Assembly Bill 1534, and as we refer to BPC sections, we refer to the former versions of those statutes that were operative during the liability period. A registered dispensing optician is the consumer, not retailer, of ophthalmic materials, including eye eyeglasses, frames, and lenses dispensed pursuant to a prescription prepared by a physician, surgeon, or optometrist, and tax applied with respect to the sale of such materials to the registered dispensing optician. Uh, re uh, Revenue and Taxa Taxation Code Section 6018 and Regulation 1592B1. In all other instances, as is relevant in this case, the optician is the retailer, not the consumer of prescription materials, and tax applies to their gross receipts from such sales. Regulation 1592B3 and Sales and Use Tax Annotation 225.0115. Registered dispensing optician has a specific meaning that is clearly defined under the BPC. BPC Section 2550 states, as is relevant here, Individuals, corporations, and firms engaged in the business of filling prescriptions 
for prescription lenses and kindred products shall be known as dispensing opticians and shall not engage in that business unless registered with the state board of optometry. It is unlawful to engage in business as a dispensing optician prior to applying for registration and being issued a certificate of registration by the SBO. That's Business and Profession Code sections 2551 and 2553. Any person who holds themselves out as a registered dispensing optician without having a valid unrevoked certificate is guilty of a misdemeanor. That's Business and Professions Code section 2556.5. Here, appellant was not registered with any state agency to dispense ophthalmolic materials and was specifically not registered with the SBO as a registered dispensing optician until after the liability period. Consequently, appellant was not a registered dispensing optician and therefore not a statutory consumer and tax applied to its retail sales of prescription materials. Appellant argues it was a consumer of the prescription materials it purchased for resale since it paid tax on those purchases. However, simply paying tax on purchases as if one is a consumer does not change the application of tax. Tax applies to all retail sales unless a specific exception or exclusion applies whether or not the retailer paid tax or tax reimbursement upon purchase. Although a retailer may be entitled to a credit for the tax or tax reimbursement it erroneously paid, as I discuss later. Appellant has held a seller's permit since 2011, and according to an article featuring Ms. Lay, Exhibit E, um, Ms. Lay is Appellant's chief executive officer, um, Ms. Lay has been an optician for many years. She's also, we also heard testimony about that today. Appellant argues that it did not know it was required to register and that it was never informed of the requirement. Um, and while that is unfortunate, taxpayers are charged with knowledge of the law and ignorance of the law is no defense. See McFarlane versus Department of Alcoholic Beverages Control, um, 51 California 2D. 84, um, Pin site 90. There is no provision in the sales and use tax laws relieving a taxpayer from liability based on ignorance. Um, appellant also argues that during the January 2017 field inspection, the department did not request it verify its registration or otherwise indicate that it was out of compliance with its sales and use tax obligations. However, the evidence includes records from the field inspection indicating that the department attempted but was unable to identify whether appellant was a registered dispensing optician and thus recommended the audit. That's exhibit A, pages 14 through 23. Um, furthermore, pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code section 6596, only a person's reasonable reliance on written advice from the department may form the basis for relief under certain specified conditions. Appellant did not receive and has not presented evidence of written advice from the department in this matter. In sum, appellant was not registered with any state agency to dispense ophthalmolic materials during the liability period as required. Therefore, appellant was the retailer, not consumer of the TPP and tax applies to its ghost gross receipts from such sales. Regarding the second issue, no further adjustments to allowed credits for tax erroneously paid with respect to purchases, audit items three and four, are warranted. Generally, gross receipts include the total amount of sales price without any deduction accounting for the cost of property sold. Revenue and Taxation Code sections 6051 and 6012A. However, a retailer who resells TPP before use may take a deduction for the, of the purchase price if it has reimbursed its vendor for sales tax or has paid use tax. Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6012A1 and Regulation 1701A. Based on the belief that it was a statutory consumer of prescription materials, appellant paid sales tax reimbursement to its vendors on its purchases. In audit, 
appellants provided purchase invoices and reported purchases subject to use tax, indicating that appellant paid sales tax reimbursement or use tax on its purchases for resale, amounting, amounting to $120,766. Appellant did not claim any tax paid purchases resold deductions on its returns. Accordingly, the department allowed credits for tax erroneously paid on purchases of $120,766 for the liability period. Appellant has argued that further credits are warranted, but has not provided any evidence to support that argument. Thus, appellant has failed to meet its burden of proof that any adjustments are warranted to allow for additional credits for tax erroneously paid on purchases. We also note that should the OTA find in favor of the appellant on the first issue, appellant would no longer be entitled to credits that have been allowed with regards to the second issue. In summary, appellant was not properly registered with the state agency during the liability period and was therefore a retailer, not a consumer of the prescription materials under section 6018. Furthermore, no additional adjustments are warranted to allow credits for tax erroneously pay paid with respect to purchases. Since appellants have not otherwise disputed the audit methodology or the audited measure, no adjustments to the department's timely issued audit determinations are warranted. For these reasons, we request that the appeal be denied. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. This is Judge Stanley. Um, Judge Kui, do you have any questions for the department? Uh, just This is Judge Kui, sure. Uh, just to get a quick clarification, because the appellants had also raised the argument of uh, personal liability um, under Section 6829. Um, my understanding is the entity before us is um, the corporation, um, not the individuals. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so uh, Ms. Uh, Lee is not being held personally responsible in this appeal for the liabilities at issue. It's just the corporation. That is correct. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and one other question, uh, just to clarify the um, liabilities registration, um, That's there's no ability to have a retroactive um, registration with the CSBO. It's um, from the data application forward. There was no way that they could have applied to to make it retroactive to the data at the start of sales or dispensing is is that else is that your understanding i'm not aware of um if they had the ability to make it retroactive but i do know that the date of issuance was june 2018 and so if there was that ability they did not um, that is not what they did okay thank you I didn't have any further questions, so I'll turn it back to the lead judge, uh, Judge Stanley. Thank you. This is Judge Stanley. Judge Brown, do you have any questions for the department? Uh, this is Judge Brown. Um, I'll just say briefly, uh, CDTFA, do you want to address uh, Appellant's argument about um, the IRS rules uh, regarding the medical excise tax versus uh, the sales tax that we are discussing here? Are you going to address it, Scott, or would you like me to address it? We um, we were not aware that appellants were making arguments related to the IRS, um, you know, IRS related arguments, and so we were not prepared to discuss that today. But if you'd like us to um, address that, we could be happy to do that in post hearing briefing. If you think that that's relevant, or um, I, I guess I just wanted to confirm that. CDTFA doesn't have any involvement directly with the medical excise tax at the, at the IRS um, at the federal level. Yeah. yeah, this is Scott Claremont. Yes, that's correct. Um, you know, we're not we're not authorities on the IRS medical excise tax, but that wouldn't be something that has a bearing on the application of California sales and use tax. That's correct, Judge Brown. Okay, uh, thank you. I don't have anything further. This is Judge Stanley. I don't have any questions. Um, so I would like to give 
uh, Mr. Lee an opportunity to um, wrap things up and address any of uh, CDTFA's presentation that you wish to at this time? Sure. No, I definitely appreciate everything and thank you so much. I mean, it was, you know, it still stands, you know, it, it gets a little bit confusing with all the codes and all that stuff, you know, from our, you know, sort of lamest level, you know, from where we sit with all this stuff. But, you know, to me, it's kind of clear cut and dry. Um, there definitely seems to be sort of a little gap in this situation here where Karina's, you know, the C by Karina is being penalized. Meanwhile, she, it was it was illegal for her to charge taxes to her patients on a medical device that is exempt from paying taxes. And, you know, I understand it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it makes sense from what you're saying, but then once this element is put into the mix that it's literally illegal like she you can't charge tax on medical devices and that shows everywhere and that's that information is very readily and easily available and just from our you know own little research that we did in a few exhibits that we submitted it just shows that everywhere you go online it shows in all the different states and everywhere around the country that clearly you know you are not allowed to charge taxes on medical devices so she would never even think that she was able to. And I, I, I definitely appreciate what the judge had said about the retroactive, the getting the registration retroactive, which is what makes sense. Because to be charged for something that no money was ever exchanged, you're not allowed to charge taxes on that. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. We would be very happy to do a retroactive um, you know, uh, have a retroactive registration, which totally makes sense under the circumstances that it's very difficult to find this registration, to know she did everything compliant. As she said, 27 years ago, when we called up, we called up now and said, you know, how would someone find this information out? It's just not easily and readily available. And I also want to point out again, and again, thank you, Judge, for pointing this out, is we are not liable, you know, as a result of this, you know, you know, kind of sad situation, my wife closed her store in 2019, you know, something that she was really passionate about. She was very well known in the business. And, you know, unfortunately, the stress of this while she was figuring this all out, you know, kind of like having that laying over her head until we kind of did our own research and said, well, this is not fair. It's a sad thing that, you know, there was a loss. And I don't think that this is what this piece of paper, this $150 piece of paper registration represents the spirit of somebody, a woman owned business closing her business because of the stress of that, you know, in 2019. So, uh, you know, I, I do appreciate, I, I never even, I don't think you can, you cannot do, to answer your question, there is no, you cannot retroactive um, the, certi the uh, registration. It's not possible. And Karina got the registration the minute that she found out, and she was still operating in business, the minute she found out that she needed that registration, once we were informed by that, you know, way after the audit and after they were telling us everything and kind of you're putting all the pieces together, she made a phone call and got it immediately. And then from that moment forward, she had the registration. So to retroact it would be the, the great thing. And then in ending, I just want to say as well, you know, again, we're doing this we're taking the time and doing this and talking about this, you know, we don't have to, we're not, she's not personally liable for this. The business has been closed now, unfortunately. And, you know, we would, we, we would rather the business be open and, and, you know, kind of deal with this, but Karina is now not liable. We thought it was important to bring this up and to bring justice to the situation that is really kind of unfair. And there's no case studies, on this before, whether someone had gone through this and didn't kind of find the angles that we found that it just is not fair and doesn't make sense. So I, I just wanted to be clear that we know we're not liable, you know, she's not liable for this. The business has been closed and that, that ship has sailed, but this is not a fair situation. You cannot charge tax to the patient on a medical device. And Karina is being penalized to pay that tax that was never collected, never charged, and was not able to be charged. So that's kind of our take on it. Thank you very much, everyone.
Okay, this is Judge Stanley. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Lee, is that all that you want the panel to know for today? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, um, Judge Quee, do you have any follow-up questions? This is Judge Quee. No, I don't have any follow-up questions. Thank you. And Judge Brown, do you have any follow-up questions? Uh, this is Judge Brown, and, and no, I do not. Thank you. This is Judge Stanley. I should probably ask uh, Ms. Jacobs if she has any follow-up questions. Um, I think you, if I am lip reading correctly, you said no, that you don't. I can't hear you. This is Amanda Jacobs. Can you hear me? Yes. No questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Lee for um, participating and presenting your appeal. Um, thank all the participants for being here and putting up with all the technical issues that we had today. Um, just one last question. What kind of plant is that behind you guys? <laughs> it's a moss, it's a moss tree. It's like a, it's like a, a you know, like a man-made kind of moss bonsai tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it looked like something out of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, you're right, actually. Like, yes, you're right, it does. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. We'll go off the record. Probably should have done that before that conversation, but <laughs> just because. Okay, thank have a you. nice day. Thank, thank you, you so too. much. You too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.